Okay, so I think the best way we can go about uh, 4.5 and essentially practicing is number one, let's review all the things that we can do with an equation. Okay, the first thing that I wrote, I believe, on our uh, little list of review things is can you? A little bit, so let me turn this up. Can you get a factor, get the equation in factor form from x intercepts and vice versa? That's number one. Right, you don't have to write this down because I will be trying to provide just a summary of it. But if you think writing it down can help you, amazing. What do I mean by getting an equation in factor form and reversing it? Well, let's pretend I give you a graph. And my x-intercepts here are, let's say, negative 2 and 21, right? And let's pretend my parabola looks like this. And it just so happens that my y-intercept is uh, 20. What does that mean? That means I have a point, negative two zero. That means I have a point, 21, zero. And I have a point, zero comma 20. That's what it means. My x value is a negative two, that's negative two zero. My x value is 21 when my y value is zero. And this means when my x is a zero, my y is a 20. Can you get the equation from that? And can you get it without me even asking because you know that the factor form will be helpful? Well, I don't know. If you recall, the first thing we need to set up, knowing that all we have are x intercepts, is to know that this equation form is going to be super easy to solve. Um, I forget what section this is in. But I believe we've done this throughout chapter three. And you might remember doing something like this for your Angry Bird assignment. Again, as a reminder, you would first plug in your x intercepts here. So how about I highlight this in red? So this is an x intercept, that's an x intercept. They go in here. And then you solve for A, you're done. You should be able to go back and forth. And if I gave you an equation, vice versa, let's pretend I gave you an equation that's like 2x minus 5 and x plus 5, right? From that alone, you should be able to figure out that your x-intercepts are at plus five and minus five. You see that this A value is a positive, so it's gonna go downward somewhere. And from that, you can actually calculate certain key points and draw it carefully. You should be able to do back and forth. The same applies, I'm not gonna go through it because we can review it a little later. The same applies if I ask you for get equation in vertex form from the vertex. Like I don't give you much information, but let's say I give you a vertex is one seven like this. And I give you another point, let's say that's like a two, I don't know. You should be able to figure out what the equation is in vertex form. That's number two. So this is, I'm, I'm just mapping out your task for this week, okay? Number three, uh, what else did I write on the thing? Quadratic formula and completing the square. If you recall, 4.2, we did a quiz on it, got you to figure out how to complete the square. You can't forget that. 
So you might want to add that in your study sheet. Number four, 4.3 asks you to learn how to use the quadratic formula. Looking at the quiz, not everyone has quite grasped it. Other people are doing it very, very well. Review it, please. Quadratic formula. And why do we even use it? Well, I'll give you a quick hint. If uh, you complete the square, it will help to find the vertex. Uh, maybe I'll clarify. If you complete the square from an equation that looks like this, you will end up with an equation that looks like this. In other words, you can help, you can help, uh, it helps you find the vertex. Quadratic formula. If you have an equation that looks like this, and of course it equals zero, you can use the quadratic formula to find x intercepts or the roots, depending on the question. So I know number one and two was a little bit far-fetched, but at the same time, if you did your assignment, you might recognize it. Number three and four right here, these two skill sets you are going to see me use quite often for the questions from 4.5. Okay? So your goal for today, goal for today, read a question. Can you read the question? Identify what the question wants. For example, is it a max or a min? Whoa, this is like French type. Max min. Is it uh, x intercepts? And then perform the techniques properly without mistake, and then answer the question. You'll see what I mean. It seems simple enough, but you'd be surprised at how many people confuse the wording in a word question or have small careless errors that end up ruining the entire thing. So all of today, all of tomorrow, let's learn how to do that. Please take out your sheet that says 4.5, using quadratic function models to solve problems Part one, I say part one, but it's only really one sheet. Part two is just us practicing textbook questions. All right, here we go. And not to, I don't mean to be a broken record, but here it is. If you read it here, it says again, it is important to know which math techniques help find key features of a function. Like if they want x-intercepts, do you know what to do? If they want the vertex, do you know what to do? Most quadratic function word problems will ask for a max and min, or when the answer reaches a certain number. Okay, these are all textbook examples. Let's see what we can do. Example one, when the question mentions something about the most of something or the least of something, you want to write that down. The key word for most or least, the key word of most or least means you're going to have to look for the vertex at some point. So let's read it carefully. The cost of running a factory is a function of the number of items produced per hour. The cost function, C for cost, is this. Where C is the cost per hour in thousands of dollars. This is going to come in handy after. X is the number of items produced per hour in thousands. If you're not paying attention yet, paying attention now. What does it mean to be the most economical? What does it mean to be the most economical? It is a maximum of what 
per what? So economical can have more meaning behind it. The max what? Well, the max, I guess, the max profit, the, the maximum value for you. What does that mean for the cost? Yep. Yeah. If you want something that's most economical, you want the cheapest thing, most bang for buck. So essentially this most, most economical is like saying, what is minimum cost? All right, quick class brainstorm. Minimum cost. They give you this equation and I want lowest cost. Think about it. How do we even get there? Super important. What are we even trying to get? Super important, especially for business. Very, very important to understand that most businesses run under a couple of models. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, because I'm not a, I'm not a pro, uh, it's not always like this, but if your business is not scaled properly, in the beginning, oh, I mean, all, you know, if you wanna start a business, you have to put money in to get a business rolling. You might have to buy desks, you might have to buy advertisement. You might have to buy this or that. So you actually might start, if this is time, you might start your business in a minus because you have to put money, you lost money. But as you start getting clients, your profit begins to go up. And of course, if this was a perfect world, your profit would go up forever, right? You get more clients, you make more money. But at a certain point in time, if your business isn't modeled properly, there will be a maximum and then the amount of co cost that's required to um, keep the business rolling starts to outweigh the benefits. Welcome back. And so, yeah, certain business models do run on a parabola. So it's very important for you to see at what point can I lower the cost? What's the lowest cost that it will take to keep my business running? <laughs> Mathematically, what does that mean? What am I looking for? Nobody? The idea is this, cost, as I see right now, is going to be some kind of parabola. How do I know? Well, I see an X squared. What do I know? What does that tell me about this equation? This equation, knowing it's a parabola, there's going to be a minimum. If there's going to be a minimum, we should be able to find it using our math. How shall we find it? Well, what did we write before? Do I still have my whiteboard? How do I find the vertex? Square. Complete the square, find the vertex, and from that vertex, if X and Y, figure out what number corresponds to your answer. So here we go. Ready? Oh, well, my highlighting sort of erased, but that's okay. C of X is equal to 0 0.28 X squared minus 1.12 X plus two. And please note, the reason I'm getting really annoying with you with, and trying to get you to know this and figure it out yourself is because that's gonna be the whole goal of this test. I present to you questions you have to navigate through on your own without me telling you. So this test is going to have a decent number of key questions, right? Here's a question, you figure it out. 
That's the goal. Isn't that, isn't that what it means to graduate without someone telling you what to do, but you making decisions on your own, right? You're, that's, that's what it means to be an adult, I suppose, right? But in this case, it's just math. So I'm going to complete the square so that I can get vertex. So here we go. First things first, I am going to group the first two terms. And leave the third term alone. And while people are copying that, if you want to put a little star on your cheat sheet and say vertex, then complete the square. Give yourself a note. Completing the square will help you find the vertex. Moving on. I am going to factor out the coefficient for the first term, which means. I am dividing 0.28 out of the first term. Well, since we're part of the same bracket, when you're common factoring, negative 1.12 must also divide by 0.28. If you take negative 1.12, divide by 0.28, this becomes 4x. And yes, the textbook specifically gave you negative 1.12 so that you would get a four inside the bracket. It makes life a lot easier. What's next? You remember? Yep. Be confident. It is plus four minus four. You take this number, you divide by two and square. So negative two times negative two is plus four. And you can't just add four for no reason. You subtract four to make it fair, I guess, to make it even. And when you do so, once again, I like the first three terms of this polynomial. I don't like that negative four there. So I'm going to bring that out. Inside the fraction, inside the bracket is still x squared minus 4x plus 4. But when the negative 4 comes out, it multiplies with the 0 0.28. This becomes negative 1.12 plus 2. Okay. And then this. Fract uh, this bracket, I am going to factor into two identical brackets, which means I'm just going to write it as a square. I'm going to skip a step. This will be x minus 2 times x minus 2. And this is plus 0 0.88. Or am I wrong? Oh, my answer key is slightly wrong. I made a mistake, but this is correct. So if you look at it online a little bit later, you might say, hey, this is different from my answers in class. As usual, I must have been sleeping. Oh, yeah, go for it. Anyways. What does that mean? What's the vertex? Someone else. Huh? Uh, vertex is always an XY. Two, zero, point eight. Two, zero point eight eight. What does that mean? What does X mean again? And what's Y? What are they looking for? Determine the most economical production level. Which of the two variables is the most economical production level? 
Is it X or is it Y? Well, let's look at Y. The Y value, the function, is the cost per hour. The X is the number of items produced per hour in thousands. Which do you think describes the most economical production level? This also requires a little bit of thinking. The answer is this one right here. And not just two. Two is the number of items produced per hour in thousands. And so, therefore, the most economical production is two per hour? No, 2,000. Do you see why it's 2,000? You have to read carefully. It says, right, it's the items produced per hour in thousands. So if the number is a two, then it becomes 2,000. Please be careful. So because this is not the first time you see this, I'm going to ask you to try example two on your own. I want to show you an example that requires you to use um, quadratic formula and then give you an example where you don't have to necessarily use quadratic formula if you think about it, okay? Um, pausing here, let's jump straight to example four in the sheet when you are done. Okay, when you're done copying, flip the page, go straight to example four. This might look a little familiar because a very similar question uh, as the one I gave you on the test, on the quiz. Example four. Okay, for a little start there. What are they looking for? In this one, they're going to ask for the x-intercept. And therefore, we're, we're going to use the quad formula when the equation equals a zero. Okay, there's your little tip. I'll read the question for you while you're writing that. Function h of t, so height, is equal to negative 1.86 t squared plus 50 t plus 2.3. It models the height of an arrow. So height is H. That is shot from a bow on Mars where is the height and T is time. Okay. Hope you can see the color difference. When does the arrow land on the surface of Mars? Now that might seem confusing. Like how am I supposed to find that out? But there are some hidden pieces in there. If it lands on the surface, what does that make the height? Yeah. And all of a sudden, you can say that your y value is zero. They're asking for when. What does that mean? It means, well, when means what is time. And time, asking for t is like saying, what is it? What is x when y is zero? What is time when height is zero? They're looking for x-intercept. That's gonna be your challenge. Anytime you read a question, you have to figure out what do they want from me? Do they want maximum? Do they want minimum? Are they asking for a specific point? So here we go. Here's a question where, Height is a zero, and I am asking for t. So when does this happen? When? When does this happen when it lands on the ground? Method one. To write this on the side somewhere. Factoring. 
you can factor. Do you want to factor this? 1.86, I don't think you want to. So method two is going to be quadratic formula. There we go. A, negative 1.86. B, 50. C, 2.3. Anytime you do the quadratic formula, please test the discriminant. I think this will save you a lot of time. Check what this is first. Pop quiz. Why, why am I checking the discriminant? Yep. Hmm? It's true. It's true. But uh, I'm me being lazy. Why might I do it? with the context that I'm a really lazy person. If it's a negative, you're right. If it's a negative, I don't have to go any further. I'm like, you know, this question is actually a trick question. You can't solve it. It doesn't even land on the moon or Mars or whatever, right? You can save yourself a lot of grief, right? So let's do it. B squared minus four AC is 50 squared. Please keep this as a bracket. I feel like a lot of people make mistakes if this isn't in a bracket, because what if it's a negative? Some people make silly mistakes with that. Multiply by negative four times a negative 1.86 times a 2.3. I can do the first number in my head, but I can't do the second number in my head. So negative four, Negative four times negative 1.86 times 2.3. That's going to be a plus 17.112. And it looks like it's going to be a positive here. That's a square root of 2517.112. And so I'm just going to solve it since we're going to end up solving it anyways. This is approximately. 50.17, two decimal places is good enough for me. Right. So far so good. So what does that mean? Since it's positive, there's going to be two roots, two answers. So let's do it. Uh, T is equal to negative B plus minus the square root portion, which we actually already found, right? Over 2A. What does that mean? It's going to be negative 50, positive 50, plus minus 50.17 all over two times negative 1.86. Where did I get the 50.7? From the calculation we just did. Let's do it. If I were to, I'm going to do the addition first. I'm going to do negative 50 plus 50.17 divided by, oh, you know what? If you want to write another line, you can. I will simplify this for us. Two times negative 1.86 is negative 3.72. Point one seven divided by that, I get negative 0 0.05 seconds. I get fifty. And I get also 26.93 seconds.
So when does the arrow land? It, er, the arrow lands at negative 0 0.05 seconds or 26.93 seconds, but automatically one of them is rejected because realistically, this makes no sense. So please write, reject. If you're timing something, time should always start at zero. Therefore, so part A, okay, uh, when does the arrow land? The arrow lands at 26.93 seconds after being shut. I wanted to throw in part B because I think it makes better sense. It makes more sense of the question. It says, how long then was the arrow in flight? Well, this one's an easier question because the answer is exactly the same as part A. Take a look. If this is my graph for the arrow, my x-intercept is right here and right there. This is 26.93. This is negative 0 0.05. So the arrow would follow this path. And that's why it makes sense to say that this is not where we want our arrow to be. Because it all starts from here. So what time does the arrow start? The arrow starts at zero seconds and it moves to 26.93. Well, here's another question, food for thought. What if the question I gave you, and this is very possible, what if the question I gave you, the person shot the arrow a little bit after? What if the person shot the arrow at one second and it took 26.93 seconds? If this is the case, how long was the arrow in flight? Yep. Yeah. In this case, I don't have to subtract anything. It's just zero to 26.93. But what if it was one to 26.93? The time between would be 25.93. So you have to be careful and make, make sense of the scenario. pretty much it. It's pretty much it. Um, you know what? For the sake of time, here's what I will do. I am going to save example three for tomorrow because it's slightly unique. I'd like you to do example two. So here, let me write homework. Example two, and we'll take it up together, as well as questions. Let's see. you can do. Ooh. Four and five. Being a good way to sort of, you know what, let's do one application question as well. So remember, all of this, you've seen it before, as you can tell, right, from our lesson today. Your goal is to start studying for your test. And as you do these one, two, three, four, five questions today, or as many as you can today, I'm gonna to ask you to notice certain parts that you get hung up on. And if that can be solved by writing on your study sheet, do it today. Start building your study sheet today, not before the test. Okay, yes, question? Uh, yeah, so for example four, the answer to A and B is the same thing. Correct. So. so in the least, even if you can't solve the question, half the battle is figuring out what to do. So maybe if you want some uh, want to scaffold it, want to sort of chunk it down, start by saying identify if what they want is x-intercept, 
vertex versus vertex or even something else. And then number two, if you're able to identify that, see if you can set up the mathematical, that's a P by the way, you can't really see it, set up the mathematical uh, equation or formula and whatnot. Even if you get the wrong answer, it's really, really, really a good skill to have to be able to read something and turn it or figure out where you want to start. Question? Once in place. All right. Now I'm going to stop this video in the remaining period of time. Start with question uh, example two on the sheet. As I said before, it is very similar to example one. I like you to try that and you know start building some confidence there. 